so let's look at the different ideologies at the different options that were around in the 1930s. Fascism is the main concern here. The war that the United States fights is a war against fascism, against the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese. Now the term comes out of the Italian. Um, the party there actually called itself fascist. Mussolini, the leader of the fascist movement, um, wanted to appeal to the Roman Empire past of Italy. And the Fasci is the symbol in the Roman Republic of the tribunes of the people. That's an elected office. Um, the Roman Republic had a very restrictive voting right. Only the richest people could vote for the Senate. But the poor citizens were allowed to elect two tribunes, people who spoke for them in the Senate without having the right to vote. And they carried as part of their, um, as the insignia of their office, the fasci, which is a, um, a bundle of grain stalks wrapped around an X, a double-sided X. So if you've seen that symbol, that's a fascist symbol. What is fascism about? The general description that captures the different varieties you get in different countries um, that is common. Aggressive nationalism and military expansion. The idea that the nation has somehow, that your nation has somehow gotten a raw deal, that there are enemies, especially within, usually liberals and Marxists at the minimum, in some cases, anarchists, feminists, and ethnic minorities that are identified as the cause of the perceived decay of one's own nation. And the idea that by restoring honor to that nation, by making it great again, you can remedy that. But you cannot do that unless you expel or somehow suppress these enemies within, as well as prove yourself <clears throat> in teaching your neighbors that don't respect you a lesson by beating them in wars. And of course, war and the military, a celebration of all things to do with weapons, uniforms, the marching up and down the square with um, flags and so forth is driven to the ninth degree in fascist regimes. So the idea that everything is an occasion for a military parade with marching band where you wave the flag and the flag goes up on every uh, possible surface in the country after you get these fascist regimes. Uh, the second common theme is dictatorship, a rejection of democracy um, as part of the ideology and program. The idea that democracy is inherently for weak people. It empowers those who have really no business running the show, those who can stand on their own feet, who use the right to vote to get things for themselves that they normally wouldn't be able to acquire. Um, so the poor, the working class, uh, all are conceived as unworthy of running the government, that their true inherent interest is really not to fight against capital, not to participate in politics, but to have a strong man speak for them and do what is truly in their interest. And that would be to fight foreign wars, to empower business so that it can hire them, um, but they don't need to actually be involved and have a voice. They're much better taken care of if you have a strong man. The idea then is that what characterizes democracy, that business of compromise, allowing everybody to speak before reaching a decision that in the end satisfies nobody, um, which you might consider a virtue. The fascist considers as a sign of weakness that needs to be rooted out. And finally, and this goes hand in hand, what the Italian fascists called corporatism, and while that term is unique to the Italian case, the idea is common to all variants of fascism. The wish to create class harmony, not by addressing inequality or a lack of democracy in the capitalist business, but by suppressing those who criticize inequality and to ask for 
participation and democracy in the workplace. And that means to suppress unions and to suppress socialism. Um, so where people had gained the right to join a union and to bargain collectively, that right is taken away again. And in all the countries where fascism rises to power, union leaders are the first or among the first to be locked up um, and sent to concentration camps and so forth. And after that, it's this ideology of um, Volksgemeinschaft. What is the term you use in English? Um, a, a community of the people. We're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. What's good for the bosses, what's good for the banks, what's good for the companies is good for everybody. Um, so the German case is a little more nasty than the others in that the German National Socialist German People's Party, which was the official name of the fascist party in Germany, um, adds to that the anti-Semitism. It's not absent from the Italian and other uh, cases, but it is taken so seriously by the German fascists that they actually commit the uh, most unspeakable act so far in history, the industrial, the, the planful industrial mass extermination of six million people because of their religious background, which of course for the anti-Semite is not really about religion, but it's about race. They define Jews as a race. Um, but as you've seen, when we talked about Ford, anti-Semitism has deep roots in all Western societies. So even this part, of the fascist regime, when they start to exclude Jews, when they get fired from university positions in 1933, when they lose their citizenship in 1938, um, still gains the Germans' applause. Uh, another example, by the way, for the appeal of fascism across the Western world is that there was a genetics and eugenics conference in, in London in the 1930s with participants from all over the world and the German delegation was celebrated there because um, they had been able to do in, in their country what others were hoping to do in their own, uh, to introduce a systematic program of weeding out weak strains in the race through eugenics, through systematically breeding people and um, sterilizing the inferior, meaning um, the, the physically or mentally handicapped um, the anti-social elements, that is to say people who are long-term unemployed, um, who are mentally ill and so forth. So this was considered normal, a normal part of scientific discourse and scientific practice. The monstrosity of this approach um, to, to breeding people like animals and to, to force sterilizing them um, had not yet been driven back out of the public discourse because, and, and the Germans were just doing it because now they, unlike in other places where the, the value of the individual, the inviolable rights of the individual were still honored, in Germany they no longer were. But with this, um, with this widespread appeal of fascism all over the world and followers in most countries, um, the, the spread of fascism to other places um, proceeded at first with little resistance. Um, in, in Italy, it, it succeeded first. In 1924, Mussolini became um, the leader of Italy. Then in Germany, shortly after, in Austria, a homebrew uh, version of fascism that rivaled German fascism until in 1938, Austria was simply annexed, taken over by Germany. In Spain, um, the rise to power by the general uh, Francesco Franco, Franco um, met with resistance. The Spanish Republic, Democrats, liberals, socialists, anarchists, etc., fought back. The fascists in Spain received military support from Germany. The Republic of Spain received military support only from the Soviet Union. Again, um, as later in World War II, the French and the British and the Americans sat on their hands, although to their, um, to their credit, 
the left and the labor movement sent many volunteers to Spain and we'll have occasion to revisit that when we talk about um, Woody Guthrie and Paul Robeson shortly. And then in 1938, Portugal. So um, democracy in 1930 had been the um, political system in most of these Western countries, minus Italy, which became a fascist um, state even in 1924. And democracy then looked more or less like it does now. You have pluralism, which is to say the idea that all kinds of different interests, interest groups have a legitimate seat at the table and get to be heard. And if you can't, if it's never that one group gets everything and another group gets completely left out cold, but rather you have to compromise, you have to find a middle ground um, because everybody has a legitimate uh, interest. And in order to voice that interest, you also need all these civil liberties like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to vote in free elections to pick people who speak for you, the representation of all different views in the political forum, the parliament, Congress, and the United States. But it's not just about the political system. It's also about the, the, um, the ground level of a society. And here, the backbone of democracy are parties, political parties with a mass membership, millions of card-carrying party members. The United States had been the, um, the first country in the world where in the 1820s that emerged. The Democratic Party under Andrew Jackson is the first mass membership political party in history. Martin Van Buren as the, um, as the party organizer helps build it. And then after that, this is the template people in other countries follow when democracy is established. By 19, so by, in 1900, you, in most countries, you had a wide variety of political options that were all mass membership parties, conservatives, nationalists, anti-Semites, Catholics, social democrats, communists, socialists, liberals, and so forth. Um, in Germany in 1900, there were two mass membership liberal parties, the social liberals and the national liberals. Um, but by 1930, most of the democratic populace that was still signing up to become party members were to be found in labor and socialist parties in Western Europe. Um, the conservative part of the political spectrum was increasingly organized, if they were organized in mass membership parties, um, in fascist movements, which are of course, opposed to democracy. So if you really are looking for people who support democracy, you can find them on the left and, no, and really not in many other places uh, by, the by 1930. One of the reasons why democracy is under pressure and isn't looking so good um, is that class conflict is high. There was a, a phase of, of modernization and expansion in the 1920s and then the crash in 1929 that really heightened the conflict between capital and labor. Second, there are cultural tensions. After World War I, the map of the world had been redrawn um, with the idea in mind that ethnic groups should inhabit a coherent territory and govern themselves in that territory. So, um, the vision of nationalism and democracy that comes from Woodrow Wilson, who was the basic architect of this system of nation states, is the assumption that you can't have a multi-ethnic um, state. You want self-determination of peoples, and peoples are defined as ethnic groups. That doesn't really make much sense in Europe, where there is a patchwork of different groups, ethnic, religious, and what have you. And the attempt to redraw the boundaries to really just have homogenous nation states was futile. Consider Czechoslovakia, for instance, which has um, Czech and Slovak and German and Jewish uh, people all living in the same space, 
have been sharing the same space since the Middle Ages and longer. Um, and you want, if you want to try and redraw the boundaries along ethnic lines, um, it becomes a matter of, of you know, patchwork. It becomes like a quilt that you rip apart um, by trying to figure out how you can put the patches back together with matching colors. It, in the end, it's no longer a quilt. It's just a bunch of patches. You know. Anyway, um, with the cultural and class tensions, there is polarization, which makes compromise look <laughs> like weakness. And because compromise is the essence of parliamentary politics and democracy, increasingly people come to reject it. And they want, um, you know, they, they want to emerge the clear winners. All the more so because the stakes are so high. There is less to go around after the Great Depression. So there is a higher price on winning over other groups when it comes for, to conflict over resources, money, chances in life, and so forth. 